So before we actually start with what we had left on Tuesday, I just wanted to um, bring to your attention with regards to the paper two um, essays that we had gone through on Tuesday, specifically the one on the the one that was highlighted that the one that was examined in November 2020. So just take note, please, learners, that yes, perfect market structure was examined in November 2020. However, what was examined was the characteristics of the perfect market. So you can still be examined on um, this question, just not the characteristics of the perfect market on its own. So, for example, compare and contrast any two types of market structures. So you could still be required to compare a perfect market structure with an imperfect market structure. So maybe comparing the perfect market to a monopoly or the perfect market to monopolistic competition, etc. Or you could compare an imperfect market structure to an imperfect market. So compare monopolies to oligopolies. So um, just wanted to bring that to your attention. OK, what was examined in 2020? In November 2020 was the characteristics of a perfect market, only that. But you so, could still be asked to compare and contrast any two types of market structures. So, um, yes, I just wanted to bring that to your attention. Once again, good morning to everyone. I see that we have um, Manzum Tombo, um, high school year. We have Voorbrug. And I'm not too sure, I think. Mr. Lewis, that is Rosenthal High School. <laughs> I'm not too sure. Welcome to everyone. So on Tuesday, we left off. We had started with paper two data response questions. We worked through question one and two together. And then I asked you guys to complete question three and four. OK, so I'm just going to move. To that slide. I know it's early in the morning. Everyone is still waking up. So um, let's have a look at this. So question three, the instruction is to study the table below and answer the questions that follow. So um, what we are given is the inflation rate from 2017 to 2021 as compared to the previous year, year on year. And then we have our years in the first column and the con inflation rate in the second column. OK, so 2017 started at 5.27 and then it fluctuates every year. So the questions were based on this table. So starting off with our questions. 3.1, so we don't have as many learners in the session yet, but we will continue, guys. Um, question 3.1, what is the current target range for inflation set by the government? You won't find the answer, like I mentioned in previous sessions. It doesn't mean that um, you get a case study or you get a infograph or whatever to study or an article to read through that your information would come from the data response from the information might be linked to the topic or related to the topic at hand so um as with question 3.1 and 3.2 these are not indicated in the given information this is information that you are expected to know or it's related to the topic of inflation so the current target range or the inflation um, target for inflation that was set by the government, that is set by the South African government. Um, can anyone tell me what that is for one mark? Wurbrug or Manzum Tombo. Anyone else? Uh, Ms. Anthea, we have a question. Yes. We have a comment from Mr. Lewis. Mm -hmm. It's 3% um, to 6%. Thank you so much, there, Mr. Lewis. Yes, for one mark. So it is 3 to 6%. That's the inflation target rate currently in South Africa. Then question 3.2. 
which economic indicator is used to determine the inflation rate. So even though indicators, economic indicators is part of um, paper one content, it overlaps with what we are currently doing, which is paper two content, okay? So um, economic indicators, yes, paper one co content, but it's applicable to what we are doing now, which is we are busy with inflation. So which economic indicator is used to determine the inflation rate? For one mark, so it's just one concept, one term. Oh, yes, we've got a comment there from, um, I'm assuming this is Rosendal High School, Mr. Lewis. So 3.2 CPI, Consumer Price Index. Okay, thank you so much. Or it could be the Producer Price Index. Thank you. So um, either one of those indicators, Consumer Price Index or the Producer Price Index. Thank you so much for that there, Mr. Lewis. So let's move on. Question 3.3. Briefly describe the term core inflation. So what is required here is a definition for two marks of what the term core inflation means or what it is. Any sentence to describe or define the concept core inflation? Manzuntombo High School and Fuerba Secondary School. Any feedback or input from, from you guys? Okay, so let's move on. Um, I'm going to put it up on the screen for you guys. So co-inflation, remember it's just for two marks a question, so one, um, one sentence or one fact to describe it. So it could either be described as a consumer inflation that is based on an adjusted CPI inflation rate, um, also, or you could say volatile items or elements such as fuel and subsidized um, items such as food are removed from this calculation. Thank you, we've got a response here. So it excludes items from the CPI basket that have highly volatile prices and items with prices that are affected by government intervention policy. That is correct. 3.3, thank you. So we could move along, question 3.4. Why is inflation regarded as a never-ending process? So in, with regards to a never-ending process, we are referring to, it doesn't mean that if the inflation rate is at a certain um, level, let's say in June, that come July or end of the year that it will be at the same the same level. It's continuously changing. Um, I don't think you'll ever find an instance where we will not we will not have inflation. But what the question wants is why this is so Just a reminder to all participants, everyone um, attending the session, that you need to complete the attendance register. 
So question 3.4, why is inflation regarded as a never ending process? Seems none of you, I know Manzun Tombo, hi, and Forbrug, you were in Tuesday's session that we hadn't gone home and actually worked through these questions. So what I'm going to do is I am going to put the answers up on the screen and then we could um, work through those. Explain it. Fadel, hi. Good morning, you guys. Welcome to today's session. Manzun Tombo, hi. So what if Manzan Tomohai, you guys are saying that more money results to an increase in demand? Yes. So if demand is higher, this results in, in increasing prices. That is 100% correct. So basically what you guys are saying that as soon as people um, or participants in the economy are earning more money, means that demand increases. And if demand increases, this will result in price increases. Thank you so much for that, Manson Tombo. Good morning to Bell Hohai as well. Welcome to today's economic session. Um, just to catch you guys up, Fairdale and Bell Hohai and whoever else has joined us now, we are currently um, working through the data response questions of the paper two, and we are busy with question three now. So question 3.4 is currently um, what we are busy with. So any other responses for question 3.4? Basically comes down, boils down to the fact that where the workers um, demand, when workers demand higher wages, it puts pressure on the economy or um, employees because as soon as they are earning the higher income, they have more disposable income, demand increases and supply might not increase um, simultaneously and this will lead to inflationary conditions and hence an increase in prices and that's why um, inflation is regarded as a never ending process. Okay, so question 3.5, the question reads, how can the government use taxation to combat demand inflation? So what can the government do, which type of instruments could be implemented or used to combat demand inflation, meaning getting people to spend less money, so to lower demand. So we're not talking about stimulating demand, but actually contracting or curbing demand. So for four marks, that would require you to supply or answer, giving two facts or two sentences um, answering that question. Good morning and welcome to Sininjongo. Hi. To catch you up, Sininjongo. Hi. We are currently um, answering the last question on question three, which is 3.5. Manzan Tombo says an increase in taxes, yes, and this will re and reduce government spending or use them simultaneously. Thank you so much there, Manzan Tombo. So what you are saying is, if we are in, if there's an increase in direct taxation, so government increases um, the tax rates, this will lead to a decrease in disposable income, okay? And um, so if our disposable income decreases, demand will also decrease. 
So the type of tax we are referring to there that needs to be increased is your um, maybe income tax. So your pay as you earn, direct tax. So people have less money to spend. And government spending could also be reduced, yes. Um, government spends less in the economy, so there is less services or infrastructure available. Okay, and people are discouraged from spending. Sorry, so let's see. So for 3.4, 3.5. So an increase in direct tax. Yes, we've covered that one. Also, there will be an increase in indirect taxation, such as loan levies, which will um, reduce money supply by making credit more expensive. This is also a, a way to, to discourage um, spending in the economy. And there could also be changes made to the charges, the surcharges on import, imported goods. So if we spend less on the foreign, in the foreign sector buying goods and services, um, or let's say that the tax increases, it will discourage us from importing goods. So these would all be used as measures to combat inflation. Okay, so guys, we're going to move along to question four now. Okay, so we have a poster over here um, and we need to study the poster and answer the questions that follow. So we have some people, whether it's kids, adults, um, sort of forming a human chain around the earth and the caption reads education has a role in helping achieve the sustainable development goals okay so we have questions to answer regarding this um, remember this question for as well was one of the questions that i had asked you guys to complete in at home on tuesday or yesterday and for us now just to work through the answers now this morning after question four we will move along because this is main topic four um contemporary economic issues then we will move along to microeconomics okay so question one four point one give one major environmental problem or name one environmental um problem we have a response over here one major environmental problem would be pollution that's correct thank you so much there mr lewis Anyone else have any alternative answers there? Bellow High School says climate change. Yes, that's correct. So there are quite a number of um, environmental problems that, you know, basically impact sustainability. So we have increasing pollution, we have climate change could be related to natural resources that are being exploited as well. That is also a possible um, answer there when an environmental, seen as an environmental problem. Then we also, okay, Manjan Tombo High says production activities by human beings. Yes, so this may also lead, so it links to what I've just mentioned of um, natural resources being exploited. Is and Jongo High disappeared too. <laughs> okay, then what else could be so production activities which impacts our natural resources and also ongoing land degradation. Okay, let's move on to question 4.2. So any one of those would have been an acceptable response. Then we have 4.2 name the main problems that impact on the management of the environment main problems 
that impacts on the impact of the environment. So if we are referring to management of the environment, we are referring to us as people, um, as households, as consumers, as countries, what are some of the problems that we experience in terms of managing our environment, or in managing the natural environment? Anyone have a response or answer to, for us to question 4.2? So we have another school that has just joined us, Buren High, High School. Welcome to today's economic session. Um, to catch you guys up, we are working through some contemporary economic issue questions, so part of the paper two, and we are dealing with question four at the moment. Um, we are currently at question 4.2, okay? Name the main problems that impact on the management of the environment. And there we have Balahar High School. They have sent through a response. Um, global warming. Okay, I'm sort of 50 50 on that Balahar High. Because um, we are we are looking at in terms of yes, global warming is an environmental problem, but how does this impact the management of the environment? Okay. So Manzum Tombo, hi, they also responded there. So people focus on producing to make profit while destroying the fauna and flora. Yes. So no consideration for the environment, Manzum Tombo, that I will, we will accept as an answer. Um, then we are also looking at in terms of what the whole higher said. Yes, global warming, like I said previously, is an environmental issue or problem. So what I want from you for the response to earn your mark is saying maybe lack of information, um, people not being clued up and, um, with regards to global warming and its impact on the environment, then, um, you know, we, we, we could accept that as an answer. It could also be so lack of knowledge, lack of environmental awareness, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay. So thank you guys for that. Then question 4.3. So you're you are required to supply a definition, briefly describe the term environmental sustainability. Okay. So what does the term environmental sustainability mean? We have and a response over here, 4.3 refers to the sustainability of the environment, refers to the ability of the environment to survive its use for economic activity. So that's from the Wissendal High School. Yes, um, that's correct there, Wissendal. So we are referring to the ability of the environment or nature, the ability for of it to survive for future use. With its, we're just saying future use, or as um, Rosendal High has put it there, for economic activities. Thank you so much for that response there, Rosendal High. Um, can we move along to question 4.4? Anyone else that, that wants to respond to question 4.3 before we move along? Okay, so question 4.4. 
explain how education can be used to solve the challenges which are caused by this pollution, by pollution. So in terms of schools, um, not just formal education, you know, guys, nowadays the internet, go on your phone, on your Android device, you have your laptop, any way that you connect to the internet, you can educate yourself. So, oops, I'm answering. <laughs> Okay, so basically, yes, how education can be used um, to solve the one this challenge, which is you um, caused by pollution. And we are not just um, talking about how we as individuals, okay, can 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 solve this problem. Business entities, um, countries as a whole, households. So how could education be used to solve this challenge? Hey Dale, hi, you guys have been fairly quiet in the session, as well as Furbrecht and Sinenjongo. I haven't heard from you guys yet. Buren, hi, you are also welcome to um, send us your responses, send it through. Just a, another reminder, guys, that you need to complete the attendance register as well, hey? So for question 4.4, explain how education can be used to solve the challenges which are caused by this pollution. So I'm going to put the slide up with the responses. No, not going to, not yet because question 4.5 is on that same slide. Um, so one of the things you can do is, I don't know if everyone is familiar with this, for example, um, some innovative approaches so to educate people where you have certain areas set up in communities or in your town in your city to preserve wildlife okay let's see here we've got a response from rosendal high to say manage the environment through education if people's attitude changes towards the environment um, to towards environmental consequences of the actions yes that is 100 percent correct so what we are, um, Rosendor High is saying is that if you change people's mindset or their attitude and educate them with regards to consequences of environmental um, behavior, yeah, and, and, and informing them that their actions, things such as pollution, etc., what it does to the environment, the consequences they are. Um, it could be a possible solution to this problem. Thank you so much, Dear Wissendal. And then we have Manzan Tombi says, more education will reduce the level of popular, um, pollution, sorry, and there will be positive externalities. Yes, thank you so much. Okay. Anyone else? So as I was saying, an example for this would be like, if in your area there is um, some form of environmental or land, I, the only thing I can think of now is, for example, in Guru behind Grand West Casino, between the, the on the property of the of where the casino is situated. If you go um, on the back where Cape Mail is situated, there is sort of like a wetlands, so it's an area that is being conserved, right? in terms of environment for environmental issues. So 
Um, that is an example where we have community reserves where, where, where certain natural elements are protected um, in terms of sustainability. Then, like the previous responses, when people, us as individuals and businesses in society can be educated with our behavior in terms of our um, attitude towards the environment, if that changes, it could bring about positive externalities as Manson Tombo um, mentioned, right? Then we move on to question 4.5. How relevant is environmental sustainability to the economy? So for four marks, two sentences, two facts. So by what this question um, begs of us or requires of us is to say, why do we need to preserve or conserve or be careful how we conduct ourselves um, in the environment in terms of production? How is this important to the economy in terms of our economic activities? So production, consumption and exchange, how does this relate to environmental sustainability? you guys in a minute or so for those responses to come through. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> well, hi, do you have a response for us? Okay, question 4.5, how relevant is environmental sustainability to the economy? Any responses there, guys? Okay, I'm going to put it up on the screen for you guys. So in terms of question 4.5, Why do we need to be aware, um, made aware of things such as environmental consciousness or, uh, in, in order to preserve um, the environment? So it is to ensure that resources are not used in a way that is destructive to the economy. Because remember, we do need the environment. Natural resources and raw materials comes from the environment, right? So if those are exhausted or depleted, used up, um, production can't take place. Um, so to stop the sale of game in terms of when we talk about, okay, Manz and Tombo as in the response here, sustaining the environment will make it possible for resources to be sustainable for next generations to benefit 
and for continuous production process. Thank you so much there. Okay. Really well put or structured that sentence, you know, um, sustaining the environment so it makes it possible for those resources and not in just in terms of production. If like what is up on the screen, the second bullet there, to stop the sale of games. So why are things like um, poaching is illegal, right? Rhinos and all of this, because these animals, wildlife are killed for trophies. Um, can I please go back to the previous answer? Which answer, Bell, or high? Question 4.4 or question 4.3, which one? Can you just indicate which question you are referring to, Bell, or high? Let's see, 4.1 to 4.3, okay? So I'll just briefly put that up on the screen for you guys to have a look and we'll check your answers. So at question 4.1, any one of these could be your response, okay? Um, as well as with question 4.2. All right, my pleasure, guys. Can we move along, Bell or High? Can I change the slide or do you guys still want to uh, need time to check your answers? Okay, let's move along. So with question 4.5, I think um, we've covered that, settled that one to stop the sale of game because the government recognized the importance to the economy and of preserving game, game reserves. So in terms just of animals as well, because you, we are, we are living or grew up with in South Africa, for example, we know of the big five, right? Animals. You want your, we want our future generations also to be able to experience that. Not that it's just something that they will see in books or that was documented on the internet, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, okay, like we experience today, we know dinosaurs lived like years and years ago, but we've never seen them. Not that we would have wanted them to be preserved. Okay. What I want to do, what I've just um, looked at is if we could maybe move along to question number nine, maybe just cover another tourism question um, before we move on to microeconomics. Just check the time. Okay, so question four. Remember the rest of these questions you can work out on your own um, with your teachers. So let's just see if we can go to question nine, maybe. And then we can move to microeconomics after that. OK. So that's just the question because we've now dealt with one on inflation, environmental sustainability. I know we did one on tourism on Tuesday, but just to refresh our memory a bit. Um, so question nine, study the details below and answer the questions that follow. So what we have here um, is some information or data recovered from the Department of Tourism, and it basically information recovered this year, early this year, in the first quarter of this year, January to um, January to March 2021 over here, and then we have a comparison with January to March 2020. So for the same period, okay. And the first column we have which region or where in the world we are looking at. So we have various continents um, listed here, Europe, North America, Central and South America, Australasia, the Middle East, Asia, and total overseas. So it basically means the total overseas um, tourists and the total in Africa. And then there are some unspecified, so it could be some um, other countries or islands that were visitors and the grand total. So the second last column, what we have over here is the difference in terms of between 2020 for the same period and 2021. OK, so all of them has a minus sign in front of them, which says that there was a decrease in tourism 
and in the last column um, we have that difference in percentage format okay so the following questions are based on this table and also just to remind you guys remember that okay in south africa we basically went into hard lockdown um last year march march 2020 okay some countries um had I think a few weeks earlier had gone into lockdown before South Africa had done. OK, so let's have a look at those question, um, questions over there. So question 9.1. Why did tourism figures decline between 2020 and 2021? Yeah, OK, that. So, yes, I just mentioned now we went into lockdown why did we go into lockdown? Why did the whole world so globally um, we had lockdowns? What was the reason for that? For one mark. Here we have for Wissendal High, question 9.1, because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Yes, sir. So, um, everywhere, tourism figures declined globally because of the COVID pandemic. Then question 9.2, what is the name of the organization responsible for international tourism? Okay, we have a response here from Rene Hendricks, could you just identify which school you were with, uh, you are with as well? So she's saying um, borders were closed. Yes. Um, and then we have Fidel High. It was because of the COVID-19 and tourists from abroad could not travel because of lockdown regulations. Thank you so much. Okay. And thank you, um, Rene Hendricks, that they have identified that it is St. Andrews High School. Thank you. Manzum Tombi, you've responded. Question 9.2, the organization responsible for international tourism is the World Travel Tourism Council, WTTC in short. That's correct. Um, Rosendal High as well, World Travel and Tourism Council. Thank you so much. OK, then we move along to question 9.3. Briefly describe the term business tourism or business tourist. What is a business tourist? Fairly easy, easy mark to say. Imagine getting these lovely questions in your paper too, guys. Breeze. OK, we have Rosendahl High 9.3. Business tourism refers to the tourists who visits for business meetings and conferences. Yay. OK, so that's great. Thank you. It was in our high. A business tourist. Someone that's on business. So you are visiting or you are in a country or a different destination for business meetings and, confer and conferences. So not for leisure, not for recreational purposes, um, but it is work related conferences and meetings. Thank you so much there in Wissendal High. Um, question 9.4. So as a result of this pandemic, explain the impact of the crisis or the pandemic on the hospitality industry in South Africa. So just a bit of background. What is the hospitality industry? Not hospitals, guys, that's the medical industry. Um, when we talk in terms of hospitality, we talk about our restaurants, our guest houses, hotels, Airbnbs, all of those types of businesses. And then you have your, um, not really our transport providers, okay, because, but they also sort of are linked to the hospitality industry because you have these transport um companies or businesses that transport drive your tourists around from point a to point b so how are all of them impacted by the pandemic in south africa 
or tool box, so your restaurants, your bars, your clubs, hotels, guest houses, etc. Tourist destinations as well, places such as Robben Island, Table Mountain, all of those things. Okay, we have St. Andrews High, they responded that there was a loss in income due to COVID-19. Yes, that's correct. Thank you for that. So not just workers, but the businesses itself, the owners, the shareholders, etc. There was generally, generally a loss of income, okay, because of the lockdown restrictions. We, you know, even in South Africa, we weren't allowed under certain levels to move around within the country. Interprovincial travel um, wasn't allowed, and they had a huge impact. A lot of people lost their income as a result of that. Um, anything else you guys can can contribute there besides the loss of income? We could also say um, people lost their jobs. A lot of people admit that was um, home businesses, they lost the income, so a lot of jobs were lost as well. Um, people suffered financial losses. Okay, so let's move along to question 9.5. How can local tourism be promoted in South Africa? Four marks. Okay, so St. Andrews High says, so how can local tourism be promoted in South Africa? Yes, um, through social media, okay, so establishing a social media presence, um, people, we are living in the digital age, right? We are living in the digital age, because the, the first thing I thought when I read this question was TikTok. <laughs> you know how people go around um, discovering restaurants and beaches and things in Cape Town alone, in the Western Cape, and they post it on, on TikTok and it makes us aware of it. So local tourism can be promoted this way, using Facebook, WhatsApp, all other platforms available. Well, how I says um, blogs, websites. Yes, that is true. Um, what I am going to say about how high, should you respond with only words, like you are only listening, you won't be earning your full marks, say. It has to be sentences um, and explaining how blogs and websites could be used and through social media as well. Um, so, and so, so, yes, you have the right idea, but you need to put it in a sentence, okay, to earn your full marks. Otherwise, you're losing marks. So, what about... Any other um, avenues besides a, a social media presence? What else um, could be used to promote local tourism? Think in terms of um, infrastructure as well. I'm not going to go somewhere where I don't have internet access. <laughs> I think we've all just become too dependent on our phones. Eh? So Manzanum Vihai says, by promoting and supporting local businesses and advertising them, yes, um, that is definitely one way to promote local tourism. Because if you're going to promote a local business, you've, you've, you've supported that business, the people are not aware of this business and you start promoting it and the business advertises, um, it makes people aware and you're going to bring more people to that area as well. We have Bell Hawaii saying 
maintaining and upgrading infrastructure. Yes, that's very good, guys. So maintaining and upgrading infrastructure because if the government upgrades or maintains or supplies um, adequate infrastructure services, so basic services, um, communication services, transport services. It's not just for tourists internationally, but us as well. So the locals also have access to these, um, to the infrastructure. Thank you so much. Then we have, I think this, you are St. Andrew's Eye saying people can do external marketing. Yes, that's correct. Um, so marketing, we have marketing, we have infrastructure, a social media presence. We um, could also say, do you know these people, the, the craft people, man? Like, for example, if you should go to, even along most of our main roads, I know, um, for example, if you go to Out Bay, those areas, you would have the, at, at, at Cork Bay, at the, at the harbor, you have these artisans that display the craft, so paintings that they've made and, you know, little um, ornaments and things like that. We, if, if we support our local artists and, you know, we bring more tourism to the areas where those people are from, that could also um, be a possible way to promote local tourism. Thank you so much, everyone, for um, participating now. So we've now finished with question 9.5. We are going to move along now to microeconomics. Ooh, everyone's favorite, day. <laughs> all those graphs. So perfect, Im perfect markets, imperfect markets, and market failure. So we're going to try and look at um, one question maybe for each market structure. Okay, let's see. Oh, I just need to, for the people that hadn't been with us since the beginning of the session, apologies um, to Roosendaal and Voorbrug um, and Manzum Tombo. I just need to go back again and reiterate this question before we move on to the data responses. Um, so with regards to your essay questions for the final exam for paper two, guys, Yes, this question um, was identified or at least was examined last year in November 2020. The perfect market structure was asked in 2020. What I just need to um, point out to you is that what was examined was the characteristics of the perfect market was, was asked, right? So the candidates of 2020 had to discuss the characteristics of the perfect market. So this doesn't mean that you, if you choose or you uh, concentrate on microeconomics as your specialization for paper two, sorry, that you eliminate this essay. Because the question could be compare and contrast any two types of market structures. So the characteristics of the perfect market could still be examined to compare it to another market structure. So you could be required to, to um, compare the perfect market structure to a monopoly, to monopolistic competition, to oligopolies, right? Or you could have, would be um, asked to compare imperfect market to an imperfect market, monopolies and oligopolies, compare the two. So just to bring your attention or to make you attend on that, that this question, or market structures, um, you cannot completely eliminate this as no, this won't be examined again. Okay? Just take note of that, guys. So let's move on to microeconomics. Yay! <laughs> okay, so paper two dot responses on microeconomics. Yeah. Which questions are we going to do? So let's do question one. Start off with question one. Mm, looking at these graphs already with all the curves, I know some of you are going like, I hate this, I hate this. <laughs> um, but if we understand the basics, guys, I know a lot of learners, and we know that a lot of learners, especially with your graphs involved, 
learners, microeconomics especially, don't pay very well in answering these questions. Okay. Um, what I can say is what helps is if you if you know who can distinguish between the various market structures in terms of the characteristics that will help you. And then also when like, you know, when you get graphs like this, when it's already completed, it's a bit, oh, you know, where do I start? But if you start with drawing the, the graphs from blank, from the blank axis, you have your, your price and your quantity axis, and you start with what the original equilibrium was, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and you work your way through it using those steps. Um, I'm going to refer you back to the WCD, those lesson plans that were made available on the WCD e-portal. Um, if your, your, your teachers have made them available to you or given them to you, you can access it as well. You go online on the um, WCED e-portal and you access those lesson plans telling you step by step it explains everything beautifully. You'll become an expert on this. OK, so uh, once again, we can study the graphs and answer the questions that follow. So what we have here. Before we continue, let's just get my screen up on the side. OK, so what we have here already now when I see graphs, the first thing I look at is the demand curve. So the position of the demand curve or the shape of the demand curve will already tell me if I see the flat demand curve, the horizontal demand curve like this, I already know I'm dealing with a perfect market. OK, so um, that's one thing. So that's why I'm saying if you know your characteristics, certain things will jump out at you. Like I know the characteristics um, with regards to the perfect market, the demand curve is flat, it's horizontal, it's a straight line then when I see the graph, I know that is I'm dealing with a perfect market. OK, so the the graph on the left is the one for the industry. OK, and on the right is for the individual firm. So you'll see over here we have a price of 8 Rand and 10 Rand. That's the market price. And we have our marginal cost curve. I always make fun or say to my kids, that the one that looks like the Nike, um, the Nike, the tick, ne? the Nike logo. And then we have our average cost curve. So this is your smile, the smile. So the position of that average cost curve is what you need to be looking at. And this will give you also a lot of information with regards to what you are dealing with. Economic profit, economic loss, normal profit. OK. Um, so if we just have a look at this before we go to the question. So now we have the industry and then you have the individual firm. So in the industry, let's look at the demand curve here. You have the straight line as well, the horizontal line and the market price for whatever product this is, is 10 Rand. OK, this means the price is 10 Rand. So if we have a look here, DD um equal to average revenue okay so the average revenue that the business will each business will receive in this market is equal to the price is equal to the marginal revenue which would be 10 rand okay now um that is why we say every business in the perfect market is a price taker or price maker Let's just see what you guys say. In terms of a perfect market, are all participants price takers or price makers? Let's see what you guys have to say about that. In a perfect market, participants are price takers or price makers. Guys, these are this is information that helps us also answer short questions in section A, like your multiple choice and your matching columns. So we have Fedel, Heidi, um, we have Wissendal, hi, we have St. Andrews. Yes, all of you are correct. We are saying that all participants are price takers. So every entrant to this market, every business entering this market 
has to take the price offered or the price that has already been established on the market. Remember, the forces of demand and supply will determine right, the market price. So there can be 100 businesses selling the same product. Also, another characteristic, the products are homogenous. Oh, yeah, no, that's word, the, 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 the um, <laughs> pronunciation. Some people say homogeneous, others say homogenous, comes down to the same thing. It's identical. So the products are identical. There's nothing differentiating the product. So if I'm the 101 yeah, I'm a participant in that market, I have to take the price on the market already, which is 10 rand. I'm going to sell for 10 rand. What is the point of selling your product at a lower price, with a higher price? People are indifferent as to where they buy from because the product is, is exactly the same, right? It's identical. So you should basically going to put yourself through the foot if you're wanting to increase the price or decrease the price. Okay? Right. Let's move along there. So along from that. So um, also, if the price is above the equilibrium. So now you're going to give yourself clever, okay? And now you go above 10 rand. You charge your customers 11 rand. What's the motivation for that? You're going to lose out on the revenue. That's the only consequence. Because why will a customer want to pay more for the product that's available at every single shop or retailer for 10 rand, okay? You should, you're shooting yourself in the foot. You're losing revenue. Um, so let's move on to the questions, guys. Okay, so question 1.1 wants to know, I know this is work that we did in term two, so you, you might not be as free. No, you guys must know what's going on because you just started for the trial exam. Okay, so question 1.1, identify the equilibrium point of the individual firm. Okay. What's the, 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 the golden rule here? Where is equilibrium? Where what equals what? Okay, Rosendahl High says at point A, sure, because <laughs> Yes, so um, at point A, so let's have a look here at point A. So how do you know where the equilibrium point is? So it's the point where MC equals M R, okay? Whether you are dealing with a perfect market or the imperfect market structures. Equilibrium point will be or profit maximization. I, um, um, they, they might be where you guys become confused. The, the question asks you the equilibrium point. Now you think back to grade nine EMS where you did the demand and supply price formation. So equilibrium was with demand equals supply. Yes, on the industry point, yeah, right? When you look at the industry, um, the graph for the industry, the demand curve for the graph for the industry, demand equals supply, and then with the two intersect at point E over here, we usually denote equilibrium with the E, that is equilibrium. But it doesn't have to be an E that tells you that that is the equilibrium point, okay? So in terms of market structures, like perfect or imperfect markets, when we're looking at cost curves, we say that the equilibrium, yes, at, in this instance is point A, but it is also profit, the profit maximization point, and that is where MC equals MR, okay? Question 1.2, which time period is depicted in the above graph? So, okay, I'm not going to give us anything up there are two time periods that we are referring to which one is depicted in the graph above so i they are saying I'm, I'm sorry man guys okay you say that i'm going to fast do you want me to go back to anything that i just said now um no, I, anything oh you guys need to have to answer the questions <laughs> Okay, so we have a response here from Manz and Tombo. Hi, they were saying that the time period that was depicted in the graph um, is the short run. Yes. And we have Fidel High as well saying the short run. Thank you for that. Okay, so um, 
questions 1.3, 1 1.4 and 1.5. I'm going to give you guys a few minutes to go through that. It is now 9.35. You're going to need about six, seven minutes, I think would be enough. Um, yeah, so let's say at about 9.41, 9.42, but before quarter to 10, um, we'll go through the answers for this. I would at least want us to do two questions, two, three questions together before the end of the session. Okay, I will do that now. Oh, hi, you know. Um, generally, I do make make the mistake. I get too excited about the subject, that one thing to impart knowledge and stuff. So I'll give you guys some more time. Duly noted. All right, we have some responses um, for question 1.3. So the question was, what is the reason for the downward sloping curve of the industry? Then um, Rosendahl High responds, when the quantity is more, okay, the price will fall and demand will increase. Hence, consumers will then demand more goods when prices are less, and this is why the demand curve slopes downwards. OK, so basically what we are getting from this is that it comes back to the law of demand. OK, um, when prices are high. We buy less of the product when prices are low or when products are cheaper. 
we buy more. And that is the reason for that downward sloping demand curve. Belhar High has also responded. They said that when the quantity is more, prices will fall and demand will increase. Okay, so yes, technically speaking, um, that's correct. But you would need to, Belhar High, you would need to start or lead your answer would be when prices are low or when prices fall, demand increases or quantity will increase. But yeah, 100% there. That's question 1.3 for two marks, guys. Um, alternative answers besides the law of demand, we could say uh, the substitution effect as well, um, which is in line with the um, law of demand. So if the price of the product is high, if there's a substitute for that product, we as consumers tend to go for the substitute. So demand will drop for the more expensive product as well. Yeah? Um, then there's also the income effect that depends on our income and the availability. So all of them are interlinked, right? It's our income and it's how many substitutes there are available as well. Question 1.4. Why are businesses in this industry referred to as price takers? Me and my big mouth I actually gave the answer at the beginning already. Eh? Okay, so St. Andrews I says, um, I'm assuming that this is in response to question 1.4, St. Andrews, or is that in response to question 1.3? Um, they said because they want to satisfy the customers rather than charging them more than what they usually pay. Okay, so you are saying, um, yes, one point four. Okay, so why are businesses in this industry referred to as price takers? Yes, they want to satisfy customers um, rather than charging them more than what they usually pay. Mm, I don't, I, I wouldn't wholeheartedly agree with that, um, St. Andrews. The reason for this is if we go back to the graph, okay, let's have a look. Um, your question is, why are the businesses referred to as price takers? So we look at the demand curve and we look at the price level, okay? That is going to help us with, and here, like I said at the beginning, it, it boils down to the characteristics of the perfect market structure. The products are homogeneous or homogeneous, identical, okay? Um, Let's see, Manzum Tombo has a response as well, so it will tie into the explanation because products sold are homogeneous and sellers are price takers. Then um, Fedel High says, prices are set by market forces, and when we talk about market forces, we mean demand and supply, and businesses don't have the market power um, or they don't have, yes, they don't have the market power to influence the price. So don't have the market power due to low barriers to entry. So there are, basically there are no barriers to entry. So not one of those businesses has any influence on the price. When you enter this market, you take the price already set by market forces, which is demand and supply. Um, I hope that gives you a bit of more clarity to um, St. Andrew's High with regards to why businesses are price takers. First of all, because the products are identical. Okay, so there's no motivation for any individual business 
to charge a different price. If the price is 10 Rand, which was determined by the market forces, which is demand and supply, the price is 10 Rand. You enter this, uh, this industry, you sell the same product, exactly the same, your price is going to be 10 Rand. Okay? Thank you so much, guys, for those responses. Just a um, reminder also as well, please complete the feedback form um, at the end of the session, as well as completing the attendance register. Okay, that was question 1.4. So we move along to question 1.5. How will new entrants, so when we talk about new entrants, we mean new businesses or yeah, just more businesses entering this market. How does this affect the perfect market? So, um, Just bear in mind, yes, we are saying everyone are price takers, but if there's an influx of new entrances, it will have an effect. So what would this effect be? So Rosen or High says the quantity offered on the market increases. Yes, so supply increases as a result of expansion by existing businesses and the entry of business. So yes, so I would award two marks for that response because we are saying that the quantity offered will increase, which boils down to, let's have a look at the industry here. The quantity offered is Q. Okay, so the quantity will increase to the right, which means that the supply curve will shift. Now, even if you could um, draw it on, on your page right now, shift that curve outwards to the right and then interestingly enough you'll see what happens to the price um because at the moment price is 10 right so let's say there's an influx of new businesses so the supply curve shifts to the left okay the man's and Tombi is coming through um man's and Tombi says that prices will be lower due to high supply and normal profits will be made in the long run. Well done, Mans and Tombe. So um, if, you, if you don't really grasp what that is about, guys, what I would suggest is draw a supply, another supply curve, add another supply curve and shift it to the right. Okay? Then you will see that at the higher quantity that is made available, supplies increase, the price will drop. So the price will drop from 10 Rand. It will decrease. I'm not sure how much it will be. Okay. So anyway, between zero and 10 Rand, so lower than 10 Rand, your price will drop. And because of the price dropping for the individual firm, this average cost curve will also drop. No? And then it means that businesses will make normal profit in the long run. So in the short run, they will be making economic profit, and in the long run, they will be making normal profit. Okay, thanks so much for that, Manz and Tombi, hi, and um, Rosendahl, hi. Let's move on to another question. Okay, so question two is also about the perfect market. Um, Zandile, could I have an indication as to how much time we have left for the session? What time does the session end? Um, it ends at 10 o'clock, We have um, okay. 10 minutes left. 10 minutes left. 10 minutes left, okay. So let's see what we can work through. So we've basically gone through the answers already, guys, so we don't need to. I'm not going to keep it up on the screen for you. The next question is also got to do with a perfect market. Let's see if we can find another question. 
to look at. Hmm, OK, let's look at this one. Question three. Something different, also the perfect market, but um, but of a difference. OK, so let's see for the 10 minutes if we can um, answer some of these questions, if not all five. So study the graph below and answer the questions that follow. We can already see that this business is making an economic loss. OK. Um, So in terms of looking at, maybe we will not be able to go through um, the answers, but I just want to bring your attention to the following. When you are answering questions or when you study perfect um, markets, right? Perfect or imperfect markets. It's important, what is important is the position of the average cost curve, okay? Um, so you also to know that your marginal cost curve, this one, marginal cost, will intersect with your average cost curve at its lowest point, okay, or the minimum point. Um, and if we look in terms of movement of the average cost curve also, average cost, um, Sorry, I, I mentioned now marginal, marginal cost will intersect with your average cost curve at its minimum or its lowest point where, you know, we, we, we the average cost or um, so this is the ATC average total cost curve. So at its lowest point, it intersects with the marginal cost curve, right? And then remember where is profit maximization or the equilibrium point is where the MC curve is equal to the MR curve. So here's our MC curve. And the MC curve is intersecting with the MR curve here at point E. So that is where the business is equilibrium or profit maximization. But let's have a look at look where this average cost curve is. It's way above the profit maximization point, which means that it is costing on average, it costs more for this business to produce per product than what they are receiving. So the price of the product is 50 rand, no? but it costs the business on average 90 rand to produce the product. So the business is making a loss, hence the shaded area economic loss. I hope um, that is clear to you guys. Um, like I said, we might not be able to answer all the questions now, but I just wanted to bring that to your attention. So just looking, going back to where the, the, the shape or where the average cost curve lies, if the average cost curve is above the average revenue, the AR or the MR, this demand curve, if the average cost curve is above it, it means the business is making an economic loss. If this average cost curve was tangent to the AR or MR curve, so it was lower and it was here, it was running tangent to this, we would be saying this business is making a normal profit. If this average cost curve moves below the AR, MR curve, so if it was somewhere below there, then the business would be making economic profit. I um, urge you when you study this, draw on your on a page, right? Turn your book, um, what do you call it, landscape? Yeah, and then you divide your page into three columns. You draw three graphs there, and you do the position of the average cost curve on all three. So you will have your price and quantity axis, and then your demand curve, your um, demand AR, MR curve, the flat horizontal line. You have your marginal cost curve, which looks like the night tick. And then you draw on each one, you draw your average cost curve. So you will have one that's above the marginal revenue, okay, economic loss, one that's tangent to it, touching, okay, that would be your normal profit, and then you want one that's beneath your marginal revenue, which will be your economic profit. So if, just by looking at those graphs, you can already see what's happening in this business in terms of profit or loss, okay? Also, remember MC, the point where MC, marginal cost is equal to marginal revenue, is your equilibrium or, 
what we will refer to as your profit maximization point. Okay. We have like, sorry, five minutes left, guys. Um, if we could go through some of these questions, we'd probably only be able to go through the first three. So let's see how far we get to that. If you have any questions, you are welcome to direct your questions to me. Here we have a response over here from Manzan Tombo. Hi, they say the question 3.1, identify the market structure in the graph above. Um, they've identified the market structure as the perfect market. That's correct, yes. So what tells us that this is a perfect market? Just the shape of the demand curve. Remember that this flat horizontal line it's labeled as ARMR, but it's also the demand curve, okay? Then we have Manzan Tombo, hi, answering question two. And question two was to give the value of the market price depicted above. So Manzan Tombo says the market price is 50 over here. That is correct. Thank you, uh, Manzan Tombo, hi. We also have Rosendahl, hi, responding 50 rand. And this is the point where... If it were the individual, for, uh, sorry, the industry would be where demand and supply intersects, and it is where your marginal cost curve and your AR MR curve intersects. That point, that is the market price. So um, that's correct there. Those two schools. Question 3.3. So this is the equilibrium point, the profit maximization at point E. The question is. How will this equilibrium position change in the long run or in the long term? So what will happen in the long term? Okay, so Rosenau High says for question 3.3, .3, what the effect, um, what how the equilibrium position will change in the long run is that new businesses will enter or leave the market and businesses can put, can adjust their production capacity. Manzan Tombe High says in the long term, perfect competitors make normal profit. Okay, yes, in the long term, they make normal profit. The reason for this is as um, Rosendahl High said, I'm gonna I'm gonna put emphasis on new businesses leaving this market. The reason for this is, if we look at the graph itself, currently these participants of businesses are running at a loss, so they are making economic loss. That is no incentive for that business to continue operating. Okay, so some of them will leave the market, and the fact that they are leaving the market. Um, the remaining businesses will get those customers. 
And at the end of the day, revenue will increase for the remaining businesses, the ones that are still participating in the market. Their sort of their cost curve, this average cost curve, okay, will lower in the long in the long run, and they will start making a normal profit. So um, you guys are spot on there. Thank you so much. Sure, it's ten o'clock on the dot. <laughs> um, thank you so much, guys, for attending the sessions for the past three days. These three sessions, um, it's been really productive to say the least. Um, I want to say to you guys, good luck with your impeding exams or the final exams. Everyone says the subject is difficult. Yes, it, but, but if we understand it um, and if we work through questions like this, it makes it much easier for us to be successful. The chances of you being successful um, increases so much more. So thank you so much for attending. Just a reminder, guys, complete the feedback form and for you to um, do the complete the attendance register. Thank you so much, guys. Good luck. Bye.